Good morning, MozCon. Wow, yay. I am so elated to be here for my second year for the beginning of a really, really, truly magical and inspiring three days of content, of learning, of connection, especially coming off of this past three months. These, this summer for me was evolutionary, not just because I left my job at Optimizely, pursuing my next career move, pretty exciting times, but because I think everyone was chasing the idea of evolution. And by that, I mean everyone was playing Pokemon. Anywhere you looked, people were just engrossed in their phones. You're like walking, walking, crossing the street. You just couldn't even escape Pokemon. I had this crazy experience when I was in New York for about a week. I was just hanging out with friends. I was doing some, some touristy things in Central Park, and I stumbled across a humongous Pokemon gym, a Pokemon gym, where everyone plays and battles each other. And I think I was probably the only person out of this crowd of over a thousand people not playing Pokemon. I'm serious. It was so crazy to me that I had to do my first Facebook Live video feed. And so I did that, and it got a lot of traction. It's really fun if you've ever done it. I don't know if you have, but it's fun. Um, and I made a video, and I'm going to show it to you right now. Let's take a look. So I'm standing right near the 5th Avenue, 57th Street entrance to Central Park in New York City, and every single person around me is playing Pokemon right now. I'm probably the only person here not playing. I want, I want uh, Pokemon there, Pokemon right here, just right outside the hot dog stand, just casual <laughs> Pokemon players everywhere. What is going on here? Ah, it was so crazy, right? I mean, just like coming into a group of thousands of people all together. It's really actually pretty beautiful. Um, so quick poll. Just got to ask, you know, how many people have played Pokemon or are still playing Pokemon? Yeah, wow. It's dark, but I can see your hands. Amazing. Even though there's been a precipitous nosedive in the amount of players, you were all part of the 45 million people who were, or who were logging into Pokemon all the time, playing for at least 30 minutes a day more than any other app. At its peak, July 11th, 2016, people were just on Pokemon all day. So I really wish that I had the foresight to, talk, to call my talk, evolve your A-B testing skills, because up-level this didn't really seem to fit after this summer, so I'm hereby changing the name of my talk to evolve your A-B testing skills from up-level. Not just because of the, the nature of this word, I really like it, but it has a really solid visualization component. I can just imagine a bunch of marketers sitting, watching a whiteboard Friday with Rand Fishkin being like, oh my god, ev evolution, like long tail SEO, I'm learning so much, yes, yes. So I'm naming Poke Marketers with an extra E. Genius, right? Or it's, it's, yeah. So if someone can add, uh, make a visualization of this, that would be really awesome for the actual marketer. I had to find these all on, on, on YouTube. Um, so I didn't actually pitch a talk on how to evolve your Pokemon. Sorry for all of you, I'll have to go to another conference for that. But I'm here to talk about a much more important, uh, important skill for all of us, which is evolving your A-B testing skills. Because A-B testing is so fundamental to the way that we do our work, from asking questions, questioning the status quo, not just accepting what's given to us, but trying to make the best decisions that we can. And that's why I'm going to talk about evolving your A-B testing skills today. And a lot of you say that conversion optimization and A-B testing is a huge priority. In fact, 70% of marketers said that conversion optimization is more of a priority in 2016 than it was in 2015. This is from a survey that Conversion XL did on the state of conversion optimization. So that's great news. Some more news, more decent than great, but 56% 56, 56 of teams will allocate more budget to conversion optimization in 2016. 4% will, will devote less. Don't know what's happening there, but hopefully we can move all up together. But the sad thing is, and the reality that's with any marketing skill, is that there's still a lot of challenges to overcome. Challenges with knowledge, with resources, with knowing what to test, like what the hell do I do out there? So today, I'm gonna take us on an evolutionary journey, just like we're evolving our Pokemon, getting all the stardust and the candies. 
I'm gonna take us on an evolutionary journey of taking your A-B testing ideas, your execution, and your team to a state of hypotheses, automation, and advocacy. So you're not just shooting shit on the wall and seeing what happens, you're doing formal hypothesis formation. You're not just making it happen, you're automating the plan so you can plug and play all your ideas. You need to focus on more of the substance and less on the process. And then going from the team of people who work with you to the advocates who promote your work. And the optimal outcome of this evolution is a learn rate of 100%. Because in order to, the thing about A-B testing is that it's not just about winning, it's about losing too. We want to lose, because that means it's not working. So any, any statistically significant outcome is positive. And then I wanna help you grow your business, because the fact is that A-B testing helps you make more money. So let's make more money for all of you. Third, delighted customers. The better your user experience is, the happier your customers are. The better your product is, the more they wanna, ba wanna buy from you and work with you. And then fourth, stronger internal decisions for your company and a more open, transparent culture. That's one of the most under, understated but really important facets of the value of A-B testing is just questioning everything. So to kick us all off and make sure we're on the same page and understand what A-B testing is all about, I want to share an example from a two-time MozConner, a previous coworker of mine at Optimizely, and a good friend named Kyle Rush. This is Kyle, so, so smiley. And he is currently working with a very interesting person, Hillary Clinton. He is on her campaign right now, testing everything he possibly can on her website. Because much like every other candidate in this 2016 election, A-B testing has been the name of the game. They are not leaving any choice for, to, gut, to gut decisions. They're data driven to the max. So one of the things that they're obviously focused on is getting more donations. They want more money coming in to their website. So Kyle and Hillary, well really Kyle, not really, probably not Hills, so they decided to, uh, to test something on reducing the friction that it would take to make a donation. And much, as you can guess, credit card details are a pain in the ass. Having to go get your credit card every time and remember the numbers and put them in, so Kyle wanted to automate this process of making it as easy as possible for people to submit a payment with their credit card details saved. So he made a strong hypothesis that if we make it as easy as possible to save your credit card info, then more people will donate because we've removed the friction of payment. So let's see what he did. This is the original flow of the process of what happens right after you make a donation for any donation, any donor, any time to, um, to, to save your credit card details. This is the original. It's like, save your credit card payment info. We'll give you a free sticker. This, I blew that box up, actually. It was really small, so it was really not noticeable. And then if you click that button, it would take you to this login screen where you'd have to enter the same email address that you just used to make the donation. And then if you didn't even have that, you would have to register and make an account. Friction full process. So he decided to try this, a variation flow where they use some logic to determine whether or not the email address that you used to make the donation had an account associated with it. So it's pretty subtle, it's harder to show than explain with many A-B tests, that's the beauty of them, so subtle. Um, but what they did was they understood, okay, this person has an email address, now we'll just take you straight to save your payment details, and if you're not logged in already, then we'll just have your email right there and you can log in quickly, simple. Pretty, pretty obvious, right? Well, it made huge returns for them they saw a 239% increase in people who saved their payment details from this test. The original conversion rate was 9%, the variation was 31%. This is, I talked to Kyle, Facebook messaging him, like, Kyle, I'm gonna mention you on MozCon, is that cool? He's like, absolutely, do it. So he said this is the biggest lift that they've ever, he's ever seen in all of his testing. Really remarkable. And the other results prove it. This is the opt-in rate chart of people who save their payment details, and you can see November, uh, January 1st, it just took a precipitous hike. Amazing. So this really segues nicely to the first evolutionary process that we're gonna go through. Going from ideas 
Just let's test this, let's add that, let's move this here, let's remove all this stuff and change it up to a very rooted statement of reason. If we do this, if we move this, if we make this easier, then this will happen, this metric will move because of this reason that we've researched, we've found, it's a foundational thing that we know to be true. And like this evolutionary theme, we need to go on a journey, it's not just a straight line. So we need to find our proverbial candy and our stardust to evolve as poke marketers that we are into this new state of status quo of evolution and hypothesis generation. So my talk today is gonna walk us on these, this path of evolution from ideas to hypotheses, from execution to automation, and from team to advocates. We're ready to go hunting, Pokemon. Not Pokemon, no, no, no more Pokemon. Ready to go hunting, yay. Okay, so on the journey from ideas to hypotheses, the first two, the things that we need to find are the analytics and the voice of the customer. Because I hate to break it to you, but great A-B test hypotheses are born out of reason and data, not whiteboard sessions. Maybe there's a whiteboard session in gathering the reason and data, but just no, no, no whiteboards. The first thing we need is analytics. Analytics is a quantitative or qualitative information about your website or app. You're all at MozCon, you know this stuff, you probably are a GA wizard by now, but I wanna walk you through five of the top reports that I think you can go find immediately to go find some really interesting fodder to test. So, top analytics sources. The first one is a funnel report in Google Analytics. You can, if you, most of you probably have a funnel, if it's sign in, purchase, check out, request a quote, something like that. You can run this report in Google Analytics and see where people are falling off in your funnel. Wherever the, the most severe fall off is, just go focus on that page and then probably run a heat map on it. This is the second analytics report that I think is really useful because it's just a qualitative kind of picture of really pretty colors, seeing where people are clicking or scrolling or looking more focused on your website. And I think you should run these on really high intent pages, pages that have, are very close to a conversion event. Number three, form error submission reports. This is like second nature because if people can't submit a form, there's a problem there. Go fix that. Fourth, exit or bounce rate report. So places where people are leaving your site. I found this really helpful when I was managing the blog at Optimizely because there's so much content there, but people exit on a good like, concentration of pages. So if you can go find those pages, then you can hypothesize something to keep them engaged, keep them going a level deeper into your site instead of bouncing off. And fifth, high traffic, low conversion landing pages. So this is an overlapping, overlapping quality of pages that have really high traffic but super low conversion rate. Those are number one. Go find those and try to just look at the data, look, get, get around your team and brainstorm some ideas on what you could possibly do to make these pages have a higher conversion. So that's analytics. Next is the voice of the customer. This is on our journey to hypothesis. So the voice of the customer gets at the empathy-based analysis of what your customer needs as a human. Because we're all humans, we're all just on our way, trying to get through the day, trying to make the best of the suffering and living that we can. So we gotta get on the same level as our customers because it's really easy since you know your product so well, you're in it all the time, you just know your website back and forth, it's easy to put yourself in this ivory tower and make things way more complicated than they need to be. So getting to the voice of the customer is a very humbling, gratifying experience. And you'll get to make new friends and talk to people. So some listening channels to, that I can suggest for you are first, your customer success team. I think it's, not every company has one, but people who are talking to your customers, dealing with the problems, dealing with the challenges, but they're learning so much about your experience that you're delivering. So make sure you have a tight feedback loop with them. Try to set up a meeting, make friends, take those people out to coffee, get to know them. Second is recording user testing sessions. You can do this easily online, usertesting.com, or you can just put up an ad on Craigslist and get some people to come into your office and record their screen and see what they're doing. 
this is really helpful to see where people are getting into mess ups or hiccups with your website. Give them an action, tell them something to do, and watch how they do it or don't do it. Next, coffee shops. <laughs> I mean, no better place. A lot of people are usually working on their laptops at these coffee shops. Just go interrupt them in between lattes and see if you can ask them a few questions. They might be really amenable to your request. Fourth, on-page surveys. I really like Hotjar and Qualaroo to do these. Just putting up something right there. The conversion rate isn't always super high, but it's just a nice fallback. You can always be collecting data. Better to have it there than to not have it there. Five, email surveys. Email is still king, as we'll learn today at MozCon. Lots of people talk about email. And you can send out some A-B testing, A-B test your survey emails for sure, and see what people are reacting to. It's a really good way to get a ton of blast, blast it out, blast it out. And then along with this voice of the customer and listening channels is the voice of the human, the voice of who we are, our psychological triggers, what makes us tick. And a lot of people have talked about these principles and I have a few to show you. Uh, one is the Lift model by Wider Funnel. They do a really cool job of distilling uh, a, a value proposition with urgency and clarity, these things that you can use to vet the experience on your website. Second, the conversion equation from Ollie Gardner. I don't know if anyone was at CTA conference this year, but he blew my mind with, he was wearing a kilt, he like drew this whole piece of toilet paper across this floor. Um, this, with, Outlining, outlining the conversion equation, so good. Really highly recommend this for your, for your websites and apps. Um, and then psychology, obviously. There's so many psychological principles. I can't go into them all here. Uh, design principles, um, contrast, pr color blocking, um, fonts, people looking at a button. Those kind of psychological things are really helpful for rooting your hypotheses, finding that rationale. And last, neuromarketing. Uh, this guy, Robert Sildani, with his six principles of scarcity and clarity and all those, these are all very helpful to root more of your rationale. And I know that's a lot of information, so I just wrote a blog post and posted it on my personal website, karaharshman.me, that goes into some articles where you can find more info on all this stuff. So highly recommend you check it out if you're interested. Okay, so this is taking us on our evolution to hypothesis. Now I want to highlight this with a story of a really solid hypothesis from a company called Movement Watches. I'm, shameless plug, I'm wearing one. I love Movement for men and women. Really cool watch. Um, check it out. So Movement had a, a, new, a new product they wanted to add to their product catalog. They had these removable straps that you could buy and change it out to change the style of your watch because for watches and many other high fashion jewelry, you're not buying a lot of it. You're buying it once a year maybe and so they wanted to get an, another idea to get more revenue in the, in, the, in the mix. So they decided to test how they were going to incorporate the promotion of these straps on their website. And they took a cue from in-store psychology. They asked, how, how is it in the buying process in a physical store that you would get exposed to these new straps. So they made this hypothesis. If we add the new product's upsell on the product detail page, they picked this page specifically because they thought, okay, you're looking at the watch, you're really thinking about how it would look on you, you're scrolling through photos. If we highlight the straps here, then sales will increase, more conversions, because this placement mimics the in-store buying experience. Pretty interesting hypothesis here. Offline, online, I like it. So here's one of the variations that they designed, the ABC. They decided to change the placement from right below the add to cart, from no, no promotion of it whatsoever, to way below the add to cart, to right below the add to cart. They tested this on desktop and mobile. Mobile was more important because more of their conversions come from mobile. And they found great results. They had a 5.5 increase in conversions with testing that strap right under the call to action button. And on desktop, it was a little bit different actually. It wasn't right below, it was a two, two-fold below. So a great example of a test idea that spawned from psychological principles, an in-store experience, your real life experience. Now, one way to really get all these things going and really promote what you're doing in your company is host a testing hackathon. 
I've seen this work and know it's not coming together with tinkering and like building cool things for your art installations in your office or hacking your product. It's taking a different stance on hacking, but coming up with ideas together. And one example of this is Hotwire, the big travel company, global travel company, that was a customer when I worked, is a customer, went at Optimizely. I don't work there anymore, though. Um, they did a global hackathon where they flew all these people out from all over the world to their global HQ in Mexico and had a two-day hackathon just spawning test ideas and just evolving all the things. So if you want to host an A-B test hackathon, which I highly recommend, it's really fun, here's four things to do. Give people access to the data, the data that you're using to make these decisions. Give it to them beforehand so they can peruse it, they can call it, they can get used to it. And then invite cross-functional teams to collaborate. Sometimes the best ideas come from your sales team or your HR people. And then give prizes. You want to incentivize people to care about this. So make it fun. And then follow up. Do, give them the due diligence that you did something with their test idea and that you, you really care about their input. So I, even though it seems silly, test, test hackathons just make this, permeate this culture of data-driven thinking and get people to know more about what you're doing. And to help you do this, I have a download for you. It's a little poster you can customize and put around your office for testing hackathons. And it, what I, we created it when I was at Optimizely. It's part of this testing toolkit, a slew of resources to help you get up and running with testing and do all the evolutionary things that I'm talking about here. Beautiful. So that's taking us from ideas to hypotheses. We're finding the analytics and we're tapping into the voice of the customer and really getting on their level. Next, I want to talk about going from execution to automation. From get shit done to let's make a plan so we can scale. This is not the most fun one because people don't like all these ions, eons words, but I'm going to throw more at you, I'm sorry. Execution, to get there, to move away from execution and to automation, we need to work on a prioritization framework and standardization. I realize it's all ions, cool. <laughs> because sometimes when you're, you're really working on scaling up, you need to take your get shit done hat off. You must take it off and think about the long term, the long view of how you're gonna make this work and become an integral part of your process. So if you want to buy that hat, by the way, you can buy it at T-Shop, four E's. I don't know if you would. I don't want to wear that hat, but it exists it, you can, for purchase. Okay. So the first step on this path is the prioritization. And prioritization, what I mean by this, is an emotion-free system to decide what you're testing. Keyword, emotion-free. There's a lot of reasons to bring touchy-feeliness into marketing, to bring creative, and I love it, just, you know, Come, coming together and really getting creative and, and tapping into the voice of the customer, of course, but don't bring your emotions to an A-B test. Instead, make a pie chart or a Gantt chart. <laughs> so here's one of the, the main ways that people think about prioritization on this axis of ease and impact. Ease on the x-axis, impact on the y-axis, of ease being if it's easier and it's really impactful, then do it in that light green quadrant. Make it happen, make that test run. But if it's really easy and less impactful, do it if you can, make time. If it's really impactful but very difficult to technically implement, then really validate that hypothesis. Make sure that you are knowing why you're investing so much time and energy into building it. Because A-B tests do take time to build. It's kind of like sussing out an idea that may need some engineering work. So do the due diligence there. And then obviously if it's low impact, not easy to build, don't do it. Just deprioritize it, bottom of that prioritization queue. The second way to do this is a prioritization scorecard. This is like the 201 version, the ease impact is 101 version of prioritization. So this prioritization scorecard says that you have a bunch of criteria like what page it's on, the audience you're identifying, the success metric in that light purple, in that dark purple column, and then you assign points to that idea. So it's a rule and point-based system where every hypothesis has its own score. Okay, some people use this, it's Hotwire, I keep using them, but they're just a really great example of a, a big testing culture. They use this. So they say give it a point if it's crucial, if it's part of a funnel page, really important to be testing those, if it's targeting 100% of visitors, give another point. 
if it's only targeting a secondary goal, not one of our primary goals, then it gets no points. So they rank all their hypotheses after a hackathon, for example, and then they put them in this chart, and the ones with the highest points go to the top, the ones with the lowest points go to the bottom of the prioritization queue. And this lets Pauline, one of the PMs at Hotwire, really great person, she lets her say, if you come to me with an idea and it's not live in two weeks, it's not because it's a bad idea, it's because I have better things to test. She doesn't even just say, I'm so sorry, thank you so much for your input, I'm really glad. No, just this is what, this is black and white. This is why I'm not testing this at this moment. Great. So that, those frameworks are really nice in spreadsheets and in the testing toolkit, again, I have some prioritization spreadsheets you can download for Excel, for Google Docs, for anything that you use. Sweet. Now, standardization. This means under, coming together to identify a broadly agreed upon set of priorities, metrics, and definitions that will help you scale. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time you want to run an A-B test. You can work on the substance of what you're trying to do and not on the, the process, like, well, when are we going to stop this test? What are we measuring? All those questions. So there's three things that I think you should focus on prioritizing. And that's one, your main success metrics. Two, your stopping criteria for your tests. And three, the important audiences that you're trying to target. Let's break these down. So one, your success metrics. Get on the same page with everyone in the company about what are the metrics and actions that you're trying to move. That's the conversion, an action, someone doing something that you want them to do. So this can be defined by filtering, whittling down from your company goals, from going from company to team to testing to your test hypothesis. Again, more ideas on this in my blog post and more things to find. Now, standardize your stopping criteria. How long will we, will, will we let this test run before we stop it? And a lot of people think, oh, we'll just let it run until it reaches statistical significance. But that could be a really long time. So you don't want to get to a point where you have just hundreds or tens of tests running at the same time that are moving really slowly. You want to be testing the things that really make a difference. So for this, a lot of companies or testing tools have a robust statistical engine that's powering the decisions that you're making, and you can trust them. But sometimes you want to have a second pair of eyes, which is why a testing calculator comes into handy. So it can, you can define the minimum detectable effect that you want to see between the variation and the control for it to be called conclusive. Other factors here are time amount of days. Do you want your test to run for a weekend and a week? Because the type of traffic you're going to get from the weekend warriors is different from the, the, works, the work people. So think about those things when you're defining your criteria. Next, which unique traffic segments deserve more attention? This is where we're defining our audiences. And if you were here last year, I talked a lot about audience defi definition uh, with my talk about personalization. So the audience is someone who deserves a unique experience. They are important enough to your bottom line, to your customer base, that they need some unique content to, to treat them differently to, because maybe they're, they're indecisive or they're a ton of them, so you have more content to share directly with them. So these are some ideas of this pie chart. It means there's no numbers related to it, but it's just a nice way to break down your audiences of mobile visitors, or returning visitors, or referral or new, or people from Google. So think about what audiences that you have that you can do some interesting post-test segmentation on to understand how they performed in that test group and who you can make experience for deliberately, more moving into the personalization. A really interesting example of this comes from Brooks Running, a brick and mortar and online retailer that sells running shoes. And they've done a pretty cool thing with standardization. They were noticing after looking at all their data that one group of people, they could really easily detect if they were going to return a shoe. They knew without a doubt that people who added two or more shoes in their cart within a half width or half size were definitely going to return one because they were indecisive. They didn't know what shoe size they were, so they bought two. Returns are the bane of existence for a lot of retailers, of retailers, so they decided to try to curb this phenomenon with some data analysis and some personalization. So they said in their hypothesis, if we deliver unique content to shoppers buying similar size shoes, then they will be less likely to return them because they've decided on a size. 
simple. So they did the work necessary to identify which people these were, de defined them technically, and then de delivered this experience to them. I'll read it to you because it's hard to read. Uh, not sure which size to get, our expert customer service will ha can help you figure out the one for you so you don't have to return the other. Here's our phone number or our email so you can talk to us right now. So they just added their customer service team on the job. They're like, people, we need you. Come help people decide what shoes. And this was a brilliant plan because it decreased the return rate for this audience by 80%. That's significant. That's way less product out there. It's just good for everyone. And it even increased the conversion rate. More people were checking out and buying stuff because they were not worried they would have to return it later. And even their ancillary purchases of socks and other things went up and their customer satisfaction increased. People said they were really happy with the experience of talking to these Brooks running support people. So a really great example of identifying a unique audience with, that has a need and delivering a great experience to them. So here we are moving from execution to automation. The things we need to get done, the, the p things we need to evolve here are the prioritization framework and the standardization of metrics, of definitions, of goals. So we're all on the same page. We don't have to worry about any of that as we're running tests. The third part of my journey is going from a team to advocates. A team is the people who work with you. They just are alongside you. Maybe not they're not super jazzed to be doing that work, but they're assigned to it, so got to do it. We want advocates, people who are going to promote your work, who are going to bring more exuberance and excitement and happiness and transparency to the things that you're doing. That's who you want with A-B testing, because it doesn't, it's not going to work, this A-B testing evolution, if it's just you. You just evolving right there. You need more people to come and help support you. So to make this transition happen, we need to get some two things, a diverse skill set and abundant communication. Just so much communicating to the people who want to hear it, not to everyone, because that's spam. And it turns out that we're doing pretty well on this. From Conversion Excel's data, they say that a team of people is about 30% of the people who are doing optimization. Only 21% of marketers said nobody at their company is doing optimization. That's sad. We want to fix that. And a lot of people are the lone wolf, the one-person team just crushing it for everyone else. So if you're any lone wolves out there, I commend you, and I hope you get some advocates on your team soon with these, with these skills. So I think the top five skill sets to have on your team are someone who can project, project manage, someone who can make things go from A to B, no pun intended, and who can just move the process along and be that, that hub of communication, that hub of, of knowledge sharing for the, for the company. Two, a developer. You need to have access to developer resources. Even though a lot of these things make it really easy, as you, if you're evolving like I'm suggesting you do, you're gonna be running more sophisticated, more in-depth case study, more in-depth A-B tests and hypotheses and personalizations. You're gonna want someone who can help do the technical stuff for you. Next, a designer. Especially if you're doing personalization, you're gonna have all these new content experiences that you're delivering. So have, try to have access to a designer. I know this is, hopefully not out of reach for everyone because you can make a friend or, or get your buddy who's not even at your company to help you, or internally, that's great. Next is an analyst, someone who can help make sense of all the results that you get so you're not in analysis paralysis situation where you don't even know what the hell that all means. And five, just fearlessness, just plain and simple. People who do great A-B tests need to be able to ask why. They need to raise their hand at the back of the meeting and say, uh, I'm not sure I'm connecting the reason that we're making this shift or trying this whole new plan. Ask why and be that vocal, that vocal up, upstart that's asking the right questions. So hopefully everyone here is fearless, yeah. Here's two team examples to show you kind of a, how it plays out in real life. This one is first from Craig at a company called Ernest. They do student loan refinancing and they're great. I, look, Craig's a really cool dude. Um, so Craig is the head of growth, and he has more of a top-down scenario where he's kind of managing all these people that are all working on testing together. So he's working on design, customer success, and developer for his team. Then there's Josephine at Hotwire. 
She's the current product manager for testing. And she's more of this internal hub. She's a bridge across all these other people who are managing testing at their own, at their own domains, their own product pages. So she works with a product owner for hotels, the product owner for flights, and she's this like knowledge base of, of brilliance. She helps. So there's not one way to make a testing team. You can have piecemeal, all sorts of people managing it, but you're that product manager making things, take things from A to B, like I said, or you can have it all aggregated in one team, the testing team, you meet weekly, you do these things, people know you, it's a, it's a team, it's a thing. So the th this is the diverse skill set that we need. The second thing we need is communication channels. We need to communicate what we're doing on this A-B testing to generate these advocates. First one I suggest is an opt-in email newsletter. Make it opt-in because if people, if you're spamming people, they're not gonna want to read it, it just won't be as good. I know from growing that you're gonna get a ton of email as, you, as your company is growing and don't let it, your A-B test one be the spam. An opt-in newsletter is great. Weekly meetings for the core crew. Many other companies or many other teams within a company that are doing this continuous optimization or continuous jobs have weekly meetings. You should have one too. And then an internal wiki or a workflow tool. So at Optimizely, we use Jira, but there's so many other tools out there that you can help aggregate and see a knowledge base of what's been done, a historical record of tests that you can look back to and say, hey, remember when we tested that? What happened? Or, hey, I wanna share this with you. Like, look at this crazy example. And better yet, you can even have people vote. Before you release the uh, results, you could say, hey, everyone, what do you think? It's really fun because and maybe people don't, people do get excited about SEO. I mean, we're at an SEO conference. Look at this, it's amazing. But A-B testing just like really challenges your human intuition about what you think is gonna be right. It's humbling. It's like, oh, the thing I thought was right is just crushing it. Or like losing so bad. So it's really interesting to see these examples. For lunch and learns, just have people bring their lunch, tell them about your tests. Five all hands meetings, pretty simple. In the testing toolkit, you can get some examples of result sharing templates and decks, so you don't have to create your own. We have them for you. You can customize them as you want. Amazing. So, wow, it's a long evolution. I'm quite parched after all that evolving. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So we just went from evolving our test ideas to throwing shit at a wall, not throwing shit, throwing ideas, beautiful ideas at a wall, seeing what works, to rooting our ideas and hypotheses, to why this is going to happen, based in reason. From execution, just making it happen, to automating, plug and play, scaling the process that we use to make these data-driven decisions. And then from team, people who are just by your side to help you muster and go along, to advocates, people who are supporting you and lifting you up. For the optimal outcome of this whole experience, again, is a learn rate of 100%. There's no winning or losing. If you are doing these things correctly, you're learning so much with every test about what's working. You're getting impenetrable insights into the depths of your customer's mind and your analysis. And then business growth. You're increasing conversions, you're increasing revenue, you're increasing downloads. Anything leads, all the goals that you have, is the many different industries that are represented here at MozCon, you can achieve higher revenue, higher growth. And then, very importantly, delighted customers. You're just making a better experience for all when you're working on the work that needs to be done to improve the usability and the ease of use and the happiness of your website. Happy, happy websites. And last, you're making a stronger internal culture of decision making that you can take to beyond the office. It's not just within the walls of your, of your, your meeting room. It's, I, I'm always optimizing my own life. I say I'm an I'm eternal optimizer. So it's a great way to just think about making changes and, and testing little bits of your, of your individual journey. So I wanna leave you with this thought that change is the only constant. And I hope that as you all go through these next three days, you t are only taking small steps back to make huge leaps forward, and you're taking these A-B testing skills and applying them to your whole evolution, all, all the things that we're gonna learn at MozCon. I'm so excited to get to know you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, so many questions on the app. Um,
was going to ask for, uh, for marketers who are having uh, trouble with friction that's not letting them get a CRO program set up internally and uh, getting things running. Yeah. What, uh, what advice do you have for folks who want to dive into all of this? Yeah. Well, I would say that it, you don't need internal buy-in for the first test. I think the fearlessness really comes into play here. You just have to do it and show people what you've done. Or you go to a very similar company, someone in their peer group, and say, look, this is what they did. Here's why they're beating us. And play that, that fear-mongering side. Like, we're going to lose all this because we're not doing it, because these guys are. So if you have competitors in the space and you can easily point to something that they're doing, I think using that fear of like the, the status quo that we're at is not good enough, that's a great way to go. Or just be fearless and do it yourself. Great. Looks like we have got time for a couple more, more questions. questions. Yeah, oh, great. dear. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, so um, someone had asked uh, how you, about the hackathons. Yeah. Great idea. How do you include people in those hackathons who maybe don't understand the analytics data, haven't seen a lot of this stuff before, are not yeah. deep in the marketing function, if you have HR people or sales people that you want to, to yeah. bring into that as well? Great question. Uh, I would say in the group, so you'll do, be doing the hackathon in groups. That's a really nice way to foster more internal collaboration and more um, just cross cross-functional cross idea making. Um, so if you can pair an analyst or someone who does have a grip on the data with someone who doesn't, just think about those pods of people who are working together and be intentional with them. Don't just let anyone pair off together. Or just give some people very specific data, like a funnel report is really easy to read because you can just see a visual representation of, OK, this block is bigger than that block. So I think there's ways you can um, you can dumb down the data to give people the, a good idea of what's going on. Okay. Or just put the right people in the right room. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's also a question about tools, and I guess mm. you're somewhat biased about some of the A-B testing tools That's to use. True. But uh, any other, um, I mean, what, what's in your toolkit? Uh, any new things that you'd recommend yeah. at the moment? Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, I think, um, so I obviously come from Optimizely did. And using Optimizely for A-B testing is great. There's, they now have a free trial. So if you want to test it out, not promoting it, but you can do that. Um, let's see. Others, in, in the toolkit of, of things I would test is definitely a, a heat mapping tool. I integrate your test with your heat map. That is crucial because it's so, it's, it, it gives you such a voice of the customer and the analysis in one. Um, a hot jar, a Qualaroo, or a user feedback tool is really helpful. And with prioritization, I think having something like Trello or Asana or Basecamp to help aggregate all of your test ideas and assign um, all the data you have to them, like your scorecard, you can do all of that with Asana or Trello. I use Trello for my personal life and for work. I think it's just so intuitive and, and easy. Um, and you can Google all the other A-B testing tools out there. Oh, my God.